Hi y'all, before I get into the meat of this video, a real quick note about the different series I've been working on, the Ask an American, Ask an Ex-Comp. These are all suggestions that came to me through Patreon, so or uh, PayPal or whatever, so if you want to get in on that, I prioritize those types of requests over random ones that I get, but I do factor in the random ones too, and uh, so that's some of the one-offs that you'll see. Anyway, this is a one such video, and this will be in response to a guy calling himself Question Time, talking about the Second Amendment. I know that many of, uh, of you out there don't like these Second Amendment videos, uh, so feel free to click away. All right, um, I'm going to address three major points this guy, Question Time, made in his video about the ugly history of the Second Amendment. And I'm going to start with uh, what he was saying at the end of his video, which is, uh, which is this. So given that the Second Amendment was born out of a concern to protect the institution of slavery, do you think maybe it's time we stop using it to frame our ethical debates about gun laws? The Second Amendment has always... Okay, so that is a textbook example of what's called the genetic fallacy. Because the origins of something are bad, um, it therefore follows that it, it, it retains that taint throughout time. This, uh, a way to make it a little bit more personal would be to think about a rape baby. You know, oh, well, if you were conceived in a rape, clearly you must be a bad person. Uh, the Constitution addresses this kind of uh, blood taint, and it, we don't do that in this country, uh, well, unlike the rape thing, uh, or... The, the crimes of the father are not bestowed upon the children to the remotest generation. We don't do that. And the reason you don't do that is because everything has to be taken on its current status and what it does and doesn't do. So this kind of question about, well, if uh, the Second Amendment was uh, put in there because of slavery, then clearly it's wrong to have it today, even though it's not true that it was put in there just for slavery, that that was a part of it. Anyway, uh, on, on to what he starts the video with, uh, with talking about. It's been one of the most hotly debated subjects in American politics. Uh, he was saying that the Second Amendment has been one of the most hotly debated uh, topics in the United States. It always has been. This is just not true. Uh, it is a recent uh, hot-button issue, but this is, the, this is what it looks like when people are trying to manufacture a controversy. If you're an atheist uh, or a secularist, even if you're religious, um, you'll be familiar with the attempts by creationists to try to manufacture a controversy to foist into the curriculum or the curricula in various states their particular view on the origin of species and whatnot. The fact that you can find, you know, some people throughout history who didn't agree with something does not mean that, that there's been a hot controversy in the same way that today, because you can get a couple dozen scientists who are dubious about uh, evolution, uh, the fact you can do that doesn't mean that there's a controversy in the scientific community about uh, the, the general tenets of the theory of evolution. Uh, it is not much disputed, though there are, you get occasional wingnuts, who don't, uh, who don't agree. Uh, this just manufactures a controversy. This is a very common uh, argument style, or a very common way of trying to gain rhetorical advantage by people on the left. And I'll give you a great example in Justice Breyer, Supreme Court Justice, who will appear on stage with people on all kinds of different fora, but uh, when he's on stage with like Justice uh, Scalia in a, in a discussion about the Constitution, or when he's giving a lecture about a new book that he's put out, he'll he has this kind of pat rhythm or pat saying where he'll talk about how, you know, we're unanimous, we the Supreme Court, they the Supreme Court, I'm not a member of it in case you didn't know. I'm not Judge Judy, I'm not on the Supreme Court. Anyway, he'll talk about how about 40% of the cases they're unanimous, which is uh, true, it changes a little bit year to year, but that's, that's generally true. Uh, and in the other cases you get 5, 4, 6, 3 or something else, not always the same 5, not always the same 4, which is true. But then he says, and, you know, if you look at uh, our statistics, I'm sure what you'll find is that not any one of us is more likely to side with the government or less likely to strike down a law as being unconstitutional, which is just false. In the civil rights bar, there are uh, about the, the worst outcome you can get in a case on, say, the First Amendment. It, the, the, the thing that will really depress you, make your day really suck, is if you see that the, the case has been argued, the uh, law in question abridging the freedom of speech has been struck down, but then you learn the opinion of the court was written by Justice Breyer. Uh, because Justice Breyer is a big believer in the efficacy of administrative agencies and the expert. It doesn't matter what the question is, uh, with one or two minor exceptions here or there. No matter what the question to be decided is, uh, Congress is fully able to make the decision, and an administrative agency that has delegated authority from the Congress is fully able to know the right answer, better than any citizen can possibly know. Um, with, with, you really have to go far in order for Justice Breyer to be like, well, you know, maybe in this one minor application that should be struck down. 
And uh, so he'll get up and, and say, like what I mentioned earlier, even though people track the statistics, the justice who's most likely in, in living history to side with the government is Justice Breyer. There's almost no subject that, that can come up that Justice Breyer doesn't believe the proper arbiter is, is some uh, somebody that's been elected or appointed by people who have been elected, not the people themselves. And uh, so they, they try to manufacture this this kind of narrative in order to shore up what it is that, that they're claiming. In this case, it's the manufacturing of a controversy, which is very recent and didn't exist at the time of the founding, but uh, I'll get to that in a minute. And it's not hard to see why. When a conservative looks at the amendment, they tend to focus in on this. Whereas when a liberal looks at the amendment, by this he means the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. All they tend to see is this. And on that it is the uh, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. So the conservatives like the latter half is what he's saying, and they ignore the former, and liberals uh, see the former and ignore the latter because they like the former. And issues surrounding gun rights have seemed to grow up seemed. This is the manufacturing of a controversy about which I, I speak. It, 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 anyway. And uglier in recent history. It isn't getting uglier in recent history. It's only been ugly in modern, in modern times. But, you know, for 200 years, thereabouts, it wasn't controversial at all. Before I address the circumstances surrounding the adoption of the amendment, I should first talk very briefly about perhaps the biggest question surrounding the Second Amendment, which is... And for those who are wondering, yes, he's Canadian. Whether the right to bear arms is an individual right or a collective right. This debate seems to me built right into the wording of the amendment. The fact that it says the right of the people makes it seem like a right that applies to individuals. While the clause being necessary for the security of a free state makes it seem like a collective right belonging to states. Supreme Court precedent. In the United States, to the extent that there is a right that's possessed by a collective, that's true only as a consequence of each of the particular members, or some particular members, having uh, that right individually. There aren't collective rights which individuals uh, get to exercise only in relation to the cooperation of other people. The rights that are, that are uh, protected in the Constitution belong to the people, the, the individual citizens. There, there's no exception to that has held the right to be an individual right since the 2008 decision in the case of the District of Columbia versus Heller. That decision overturned 70 years of precedent established by the United States versus Miller in 1939, which... That is not true. ...held that the framers included the Second Amendment to ensure the effectiveness of the military. Okay, so, um... Let's just go have a look. Uh, part of his video, he talks about uh, the precedent and how it's been overruled. This is a common confusion people have. They mistake a holding for dicta. Uh, the holding is, a, they're really easy to spot. The, 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 uh, whatever the question to be answered by the court is titled right at the top, you just put right at the top of the page under the title of the, the, uh, the case. And then it will, it'll explain what the question is and then it'll say held and then it'll be thing the first and then thing the second, however many things there are that are actually being litigated. That's the holding, that's the precedent. And then after that, you get a statement of the facts that give rise to the, the litigation, and then an analysis of this, an analysis of that, an analysis of, of the other, and an explanation as to how they reach their decision. All of that is dicta, and that may or may not be uh, somewhat persuasive to lower federal courts or to state courts about, the, about uh, future litigation on related matters, but it isn't the holding of the case. Uh, so... Um, he says that uh, D.C. against Heller overturned uh, U.S. v. Miller. It did not, and uh, nor did it actually question the, the holding of Miller. So here's, here's what U.S. v. Miller actually held. Uh, the National Firearms Act, as applied to, one indicted for transporting in interstate commerce a 12-gauge shotgun with a barrel less than 18 inches long without having registered it and without having in his possession a stamp affixed written order for it as required by the act held one. Not unconstitutional as an invasion of the reserved powers of the states. Two, not violative of the Second Amendment of the Federal Constitution. So what isn't violative of the Second uh, Amendment to the Federal Constitution and what isn't encroaching on states' uh, prerogatives? It is uh, a person who is transporting in interstate commerce a 12-gauge shotgun with a barrel less than 18 inches long, which he has not registered and which he has not, uh, and without having in his possession at the same time as the weapon, a stamp of fixed written order for that weapon. It only applies to shotguns with, with barrels shorter than 18 inches. It doesn't apply to anything else. It doesn't purport to talk about 
whether it's a military right, whether it is a, an individual right, a group right, it's not the holding of the case. So let's go read some of the, uh, the backdrop to the, um, some of the dicta. The court cannot take judicial notice that a shotgun having a barrel less than 18 inches uh, long has today any reasonable relation to the preservation or efficiency of a well-regulated militia, and therefore cannot say that the Second Amendment guarantees to the citizen the right to keep and bear such a weapon. Guarantees to the citizen, not to the military, not to the militia. Uh, for those of you who don't know what judicial notice is, it is the recognition of a fact that is not actually in the record, hasn't been proved in the record, but is so obvious that no reasonable person could possibly dispute it. For example, judges could take judicial notice, even though it hasn't been proved in court by an expert or whatever, that a defendant who is sitting at the defendant's table having a conversation with his lawyer after having walked in is in fact not fucking dead. He can take judicial notice of the continued uh, living state of a defendant. He can take judicial notice that when the sun is high in the sky, it's daylight, and when it's below the horizon, it's the night time. That won't be proved in court, but the judges don't have to ignore overwhelmingly obvious things that no reasonable person could possibly uh, dispute. So I have little doubt that uh, a judge could not take judicial notice of the common weaponry used in the military, because that is not something that is commonly known to the average ordinary citizen, because they're not hoplologists. They don't study this for a living. You should not expect that that would be within the knowledge of the average, uh, the average reasonable citizen. A shotgun? I don't know. Is that useful in war? What do I know? I don't fight wars. Um, but if we're going to start talking about uh, dicta being as being the holding, let's go back. Uh, let's go back and look at uh, modern jurisprudence and compare that against, say, Dred Scott. A terrible decision, I know. So from Dred Scott, it's, uh, they wanted to deny. They did, in fact, deny citizenship to uh, black people to those Negroes. It would give, uh, if you granted one Negro citizenship, it would give rise to persons of the Negro race who were recognized as citizens in any one state of the Union, the right to enter every other state of the Union, uh, I'm, or, I'm sorry, every other state, whenever they pleased, singly or in companies without pass or passport and without obstruction, to sojourn there as long as they pleased, to go where they pleased at every hour of the day or night without molestation, unless they committed some violation of law for which a white man would be punished. And it would give them the full liberty of speech in public and in private upon all subjects upon which its own citizens might speak. The horror of letting black people have opinions. Uh, and to hold public meetings upon political affairs. That would be terrible if those Negroes got consulted on, I don't know, political affairs that affected whether or not they remained slaves or whether or not their freedom had to be recognized once they are freed or any kinds of those issues. And here's the crucial part. And to keep and carry arms wherever they went. This is not at all controversial. It wasn't controversial 100 years ago. It wasn't controversial 200 years ago. It is only controversial recently, and it is largely a manufactured controversy. And all of this would be done in the face of, of the subject race of the same color, both free and slaves, and inevitably producing, I'm sorry, inevitably producing discontent and insubordination among them. Those uppity niggers, they might try to free themselves from the bonds of slavery. We can't have that and endangering the peace and safety of the state. I'm pretty sure I can think of a group of people who would like to keep and carry arms and engage in a little bit of that discontent, discontent and insubordination, namely all the black people in all of the United States. Uh, this was an attempt by the court to avoid racial tensions. <laughs> Great job there, Supreme Court. That's why they shouldn't be involved in political matters. They should decide issues of law, not of politics. Anyway, so, um, apparently, the, the idea that this guy wants to propose, this question time guy wants to propose, is something of evaluating uh, precedents and the Supreme Court case and you know, all this other shit, uh, but in, in a way that's favorable to him, that, that falls into his narrative of there actually, ha there actually existing uh, some kind of controversy, as, as opposed to just keeping the, the status quo where it's not controversial and the right is just a freestanding one belonging to each individual particular citizen, you know, except for people who have been adjudicated guilty for, for, uh, for various felonies, notorious and infamous crimes, the mentally unstable, things like things that have, have always existed. Uh, so let's, uh, let's go back to the United States against Miller and read some of the apparently controversial claims that this guy says has always been hotly debated. Um, oh, before I do that, real quick, it, um, hotly, hotly debated. 
if you go back and and, and look at, at the time that the Second Amendment was adopted, contrary to what this guy is saying, Pacey, his proposition, which is that it was slave owners against you know the, everybody else, it was anti-federalists against against federalists, and uh, the se the the amendments were proposed to mollify the concerns not of slave owners as such, but of anti-federalists who were worried that uh, the federal, you know, uh, Article One, Section Eight, clauses fifteen and sixteen might have al allowed the federal Congress to you know, get rid of the militias. Uh, Hamilton talked about this in Federal Eighty Four. This is so. What the Second Amendment means is so controversial. It took up, you know, a token reference, not even directly by name. In one of the Federalist Papers, this was written by uh, uh, Hamilton, and he was just saying, look, uh, if, you, if you try to put this Bill of Rights in there, I'm opposed to it for the following reason, you will actually wind up usurping the very right you seek to protect, because in the future, what's going to happen is that people are going to say, look, it should not be supposed that the framing generation were so stupid as to written into the Constitution an amendment to restrain a power that didn't exist. Clearly, the power somewhere exists in the Constitution, despite the fact that nowhere in the Constitution does it even purport to claim that the Federal Congress has the power to get rid of the militia, to impose a religion, uh, to regulate speech, to do you know to quarter troops in your homes, to, to prevent people from having trials. Nowhere in there is any right, any power granted to the Federal uh, Government to do anything on these issues at all. Uh, but you will give to you will give an argument, a, a plausible pretense of an argument, to a dishonest usurper of liberty in the future to come by and do exactly what question time here is doing exactly what this manufactured controversy is. Instead of talking about the right, which actually the guy does at the end, he says we should get away from the legal thing and just talk about what the right should or shouldn't be, or what the ethics of it should or shouldn't be actually, but putting that off to the side real quick. Instead of talking about what the actual right is, people will start talking about what the amendment says, as opposed to just dealing with the right. Oh, um, so the uh, in the House, at the time of when they were hammering out what the amendments would be, um, someone proposed that the right should be restricted to, um, I'm sorry, that, the, that they, should make, they should take care to put in there that the right belongs to the citizen for his or her own personal use. And it was so bizarre for him to have said that because no one doubted it. That it didn't even get onto the floor to be debated. They're like, of course it belongs to the citizen. Who else would a right belong to? You know, anyway. And then in the Senate, uh, this is uh, Wednesday, September 9th, 1789, they had a debate, and then they, they voted on the debate. Uh, they, the, the motion was, on motion to amend Article 5th to insert these words, quote, for the common defense, end quote, next to the words, quote, bear arms, end quote, it passed in the negative. So they, uh, they wanted to, um, some of the senators, wanted to propose that it was a right related to service in the militia, and it was for the common defense. And that was roundly voted down in the first Congress, which proposed the amendments to the states, and they ratified it on that backdrop. And also, real quickly, because he, he brought up uh, the so-called Militia Clauses, Article 1, Section 8, clause, uh, Clauses 15 and 16. Uh, as Paul Clement in the D.C. against Heller case uh, pointed out in oral arguments, it is an embarrassment to this side of the, the other side of the argument to say that, because if Madison were really addressing that, you would think that he would have proposed uh, the second, what became the Second Amendment, as a uh, as an amendment to Article One, Section Eight, clauses uh, clauses fifteen and sixteen, but he didn't. He proposed it as an amendment to Article One, Section Nine. Article One, Section Eight deals with the enumerated powers of Congress. It says, "Here is your exhaustive list of enumerated powers, the objects over which you uh, you get to legislate." And then Article One, Section Nine says, "These are individual rights. You know, bill, citizens will be free of bills of attainder." Uh, you shall not suspend the great writ except for in cases, in cases of insurrection or rebellion when the public safety shall require it. Uh, you shall not uh, impose direct taxes or capitation unless following a census, these, these kinds of things. So it was, these, are, these are things that says, notwithstanding whatever your powers may be, you need to stay that you need to uh, be hands off except for what we expressly grant you with respect to interfering uh, citizens' rights. <clears throat> anyway, so back to U.S. V. Miller. Um, talking about the history of the Second Amendment and its purpose and whatnot. With the obvi with obvious purpose to assure the continuation and render possible the effectiveness of such forces, militia, uh, the Declaration and Guarantee of the Second Amendment were made. It must be interpreted and applied with that end in view. The militia, which the states were expected to maintain and train, is set in contrast with the troops, which they were forbidden to keep without the consent of Congress. This is from Article 1. They, uh, no state without the consent of Congress. 
can keep in peacetime troops or ships of war, that kind of thing. So contrary to what this guy's saying, I don't know where he gets this shit from, it, it wasn't about the military versus the citizens. Uh, the, the militia was, you, okay, you had citizens, uh, you had the militia, and then you had the military. These are not the same things, they're not interchangeable. Okay, um, the sentiment of, of the time strongly disfavored standing armies. The common view was that, that, was that adequate defense of the country and laws could be secured through the militia. Civilians primarily soldiers on occasion. The signification attributed to the term militia appears from the debates in the convention, the history and legislation of the colonies and states, and the writings of approved commentators. These show plainly enough that the militia comprised all males physically capable of acting in concert for the common defense. It does not say uh, physically able and in fact operating in, in concert for the common defense. Just physically capable. If you were an able-bodied swinging dick person who wasn't black, you know, if you were a citizen, uh, you got a gun. A body of citizens enrolled for military discipline, and further, that ordinarily, when called for service, these men were expected to appear bearing arms supplied by themselves, and of the, the kind in common use at the time. That's from, this may sound familiar from the Heller decision. Uh, citizens have a right to carry fire, to keep and, and bear firearms uh, for their, their own personal use that are of the type of the common use, and common use today. So, the American colonies in the 17th century by, Osgo, uh, by Osgood, Volume 1, Chapter 18, affirms in reference to the early system of defense in, in New England, quote, in all the colonies as in England, the militia system was based on the principle of the uh, assize of arms. This implied the general obligation of all adult male inhabitants to possess arms and, with certain exceptions, to uh, cooperate in the work of defense. So, an assize of arms goes back to uh, ancient England, like the 12th century, and it's derivative of Anglo-Saxon law from like the 5th or the 4th centuries. This is not a new concept, it's not a controversial concept, and the obligation under the assize of arms, it was an edict issued saying that all uh, all men, all able-bodied men, must be armed, they must keep and carry firearms, take a various oaths and whatnot, and that their failure to do this not only would cost them their property and chattel, but their limbs. They, you know, they, I, I don't know, I guess they chopped off your arms, maybe your privy parts, whatever it is, if you did not keep yourself well armed uh, for the king's disposal whenever he, might, uh, whenever he might require you. And this goes back to, as I mentioned, Anglo-Saxon law from centuries before. This, this comes out of the mists of, of history, not controversial until the last couple decades, which apparently means it's always been controversial. The possession of arms also implied the possession of ammunition, and the authorities paid quite as much attention to the latter as to the former. A year later, 1632, it was ordered that any single man who had not furnished himself with arms might be put out to service, and this became a permanent part of the legislation of the colony, Massachusetts in this case. Also, clauses intended to, to uh, ensure the possession of arms and ammunition by all who were subject to military service appear in all the important enactments concerning military affairs. Fines were the penalty for delinquency, uh, whether of the towns or individuals. According to the usage of the times, the infantry of the Massachusetts, I'm sorry, the infantry of Massachusetts consisted of pikemen and musketeers. The law as enacted in 1649 and thereafter provided that each of the former <laughs> should be armed with a pike, corselet, headpiece, sword, and knapsack. The musketeer should carry a, quote, good fixed musket, end quote, not under bastard musket bore, not less than three feet nine inches, nor more than four feet three inches in length. <laughs> a priming wire, scour, mold, sword, rest, bandoliers, one pound of powder, twenty bullets, and two fathoms of match. The law also required <laughs> that two-thirds of each company should be musketeers. The General Court of Massachusetts, January session 1784, provided for the organization and government of the militia, directed that the train band well, an ancient term for the militia coming from, I think, the 15th century in England anyway, should contain all able-bodied men from 16 to 40 years of age, and the alarm list all other men uh, under 60 years of age. Also, that every NCO, officer, and private soldier said militia not under the control of parents, mem <laughs> masters, or guardians, and being of sufficient ability, therefore, in the judgment of the selectman of the town in which he shall dwell, shall equip himself, and be constantly provided with a good firearm. So if you really want to talk about what the uh, the historical core of the Second Amendment is, the right that is there, it's not only a right, it's an obligation that all, all able-bodied men are required upon pain of imprisonment, fine, or in t to in in uh, indeed, perhaps even losing of body parts, to be at all times armed. And it is also completely vacuous to say that the modern-day Second Amendment, which... Uh, 
you, because of the history of slavery, should go away or whatever uh, for our ethical considerations when the last 150 years of the Second Amendment has been to give to the black folks the same rights enjoyed by the white folks that were wrongly usurped from them, wrongly taken from these black people, so to make sure that the black community could forever resist the tyranny of any white community in the future, any other community in the future for that matter, who might wish uh, to rechain them. And uh, so you say that uh, it started off to support slavery, and then uh, within just a couple generations, uh, the, the argument was against letting, let black, letting black people be citizens because then they would have the same right, the same private right available to white people for their own defense against being slaves themselves. And then after the war, they were made citizens, uh, uncontrovertibly made citizens by the ratification of three amendments in, uh, in general. Um, so that way they too could secure to themselves and their posterity the blessings of liberty. But somehow or other, what happened in, in, seven, in the 1770s, oppressing the blacks, is important, but freeing the blacks and letting them enjoy the same rights that you or I would have enjoyed at the time so they could see to their own security and liberty is completely irrelevant. Who knew? All right, you guys have a good day.